I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast, Rob. This is, I think, part, part six? Five. Part five. Well, we don't actually know which part. We we never know ahead of time where we're going to schedule these things. This could be the end of the series. This could be part five of the I series. think this is going to, I think we should end the series with this. You think so? So this is the concluding, the concluding moment in our series, Not Made in China. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. God, you don't speak French. You don't speak Arabic. Like, what do you speak, man? Um. Yes. It, you know, Allah willing, this will be the last episode of of this series. Of I the think podcast. he definitely will will it because we don't have any other ideas for how to continue it. So, <laughs> um, which is sort of a segue into the actual content of what we're doing. It's from a short story collection by N. Kim. In Kim Chu, whose name in Mandarin is Huang Jin Tao. But of course, In Kim Chu is how he prefers it to be pronounced, especially by English speakers. Right. Because In Kim Chu is a, he's born in Malaysia. He is one of the uh, Minanyu speaking folks. Uh, who populate much of of Malaysian society? And so, fact, clarify what does that mean? Minanyu. Minanyu is the is one of the languages that originates in the southeastern Chinese province of Fujian, but actually has spread all over the world with Chinese immigrants. Now, people in America and much of the West think of Cantonese as being the most important dialect, other than Mandarin, outside of China. But actually, it's it's really more of Minanyu, and uh, Fujianese speakers have been moving in, particularly Southeast Asia, uh, for for the past six, seven, eight hundred years. Um, and there are huge populations of Fujianese speakers, Minanyu speakers, throughout uh, Southeast Asia. And I don't even want to get into whether or not Taiwan qualifies as Ooh. as as a as a part of, as as something other than China, because that's we don't do politics. We don't do politics in the show. No, no, no way. No politics. Um, but there are, I mean, it, at least I think sixty to seventy percent of Taiwan is, is a native Fujianese Minanyu speakers. And you can hear the accent if you ever go there. You and I yeah. have both been there. You and I both love Taiwan. Uh, Absolutely. One of the reasons I love it is because. Although it's it it takes a little bit of adjustment to to follow the Chinese, if you've hung out on the mainland much and you're fluent in Chinese, you you, you can track what's going on. If you go to Hong Kong, you're up the creek because that's yeah. not the same thing at all. So the difference between Mandarin, Cantonese, and Minanyu is similar to Spanish, Portuguese, and French. Hmm. You know, I think the French and, and Portuguese are about 15% uh, different in terms of vocabulary, mm. which 15 to 20% in linguistic terms, and I'm using actual numbers that I, I can back up with linguistics, uh, that's where languages become uncomprehensible. Right. Uh, French and Portuguese and French and Spanish are... Much more different, but because most because so many more people speak French as a lingua franca, uh, it kind of works out that sometimes Spanish speakers and Portuguese speakers who both know French as a mutual language will end up speaking together. Cantonese and and Minanyu are in a lot of ways similar, mm. but they're actually like it's much easier to communicate in Mandarin sometimes. Mm. Yeah, um, that's uh, a quite a tangent right. from In Kim Chu, there you go. who is the uh, author that we're looking at today. The The story that we're looking at, we're taking the English translation straight out of uh, Carlos Rojas' book, uh, his, his translation of In Kim Chu's stories. The title of that series of stories is Slow Boat to China, and we're looking particularly today at the story called Allah's Will, which is one of the best stories you and I have read in a long time. It's great, isn't it's a it? a really good story you for so many reasons. You haven't read In Kim Chu ever before. I have never, no. Have you, had you even heard of him? I had not, no. So my my advisor, uh, Alison Grappi, is an expert on In Kim Chu. Mm. 
and several other Chinese speaking Malaysian authors. Mm. And so that's how I kind of got introduced to him. And actually, he was one of the main authors I wanted to do when we did this Not Made in China yeah. literature series, which Not Made in China, the that's also the name of Professor Grappi's uh, book on Sino Malaysian mm-hmm. authors. Uh, so I think he is really a, a fascinating, very interesting figure. He's, and and I, I, I want to put this out there too. Um, sorry, I cut you off. But um, if and I'm coming at this cold, I have no understand, no knowledge. And of, you're not just saying this because we're recording it is getting in October. Colder. It is quite chilly. So in in both literally and figuratively, coming at this cold, <laughs> um, it's utterly fascinating to come at this material with no prior. A study because other than like standard kind of Chinese literature, yeah. Like I, 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 I study mainland Chinese is kind of like the canon, almost the modern canon, right? I part of my thesis is on Lu Xun and you know writers like that. So you know, I'm I've read dibs and dabs of Sinophone literature. Sinophone being you know, Sinophone is the Chinese speaking Chinese written literature, uh, but not necessarily in China, but. It can almost be um, disorienting it reading is. this this story because you're like, wait, so hang on. So is he Chinese or not? Wait, what does that mean exactly? And I think that question brings us to the point where we really want to outline the plot. Yeah, go ahead and go ahead and do that. Um, so the story, so there is actually in, in Malaysia, there is a large population of Chinese speaking, ethnically Chinese folks. Um, these are the same people who populate Singapore. Singapore briefly was a part of Malaysia for about two years. It broke off into a separate country, but there are still lots of Chinese, ethnically Chinese people in Malaysia. Um, but the dominant group is Malaysia, but that wasn't really always true. At 1945, um, Chinese folks made up the plurality of m- individuals in Malaysia. But what has happened in the past 70, 80 years is that uh, the Malaysians have been taking back power. And so that's the kind of po- socio political context for this story, which begins in the 1950s with this ethnically Chinese Malaysian author. He is a part of a Chinese rebellion that took over much of Malaysia in the 1950s and fought it out with the British and the native Malaysians. And uh, he's caught, but he's saved from execution because his best friend growing up is a Malaysian prince. And all of his friends who are in this, who commit this crime with him uh, of rebelling against the state, are apparently executed. The narrator, whose last name is Liu, he uh, he thinks he's executed. We hear the gunshots fired. We hear the clicking of the gun. But actually, his Malaysian prince friend cooks, hatches up this other plan. And what he's going to do, this Malaysian is going to send his Chinese friend to an island in the middle of the South China Sea, which is actually much closer to Malaysia than it is to China. Um, And he's going to force him to be stripped of his Chinese identity and live on this little backwards island group with a group of people who don't really like they're Malaysian, they're Muslim, the the majority of of uh, all if you're ethnically Malaysian in Malaysia, you are legally required to be Muslim. That's just the law. Um and so he has to convert to Islam and he becomes a part of this Malaysian group and he's not allowed to use Chinese language. Uh, or do anything related to China. He has to completely give up his Chinese identity, and he can't leave the island. And most importantly, he can't contact anyone from his old life. So his yeah. parents, friends, nobody. Everybody thinks he's dead. So, That's the condition for him staying alive. So one of the, the first acts that happens when he's on this island um, is that he's circumcised because of yeah. course Muslims have you know it's a requirement for Muslims to be circumcised uh, just as it is with Jews but Chinese most average Chinese people aren't circumcised right 
And there is this sense that the circumcision is actually an act of castration. When he's talking about it in the story, the the narrator mentions that the knife that was used to circumcise him looks a lot like the knife that his father used to castrate pigs. And in fact, the the poultice they use on his wound afterwards, he mentioned smells like the yeah. poultice his father used to use on castrated pigs. And and his when he's caught committing that crime, I don't know if you remember this, Rob, but he calls the prince, calls the narrator, yeah. he calls him not just a pig, but a chinaju, hmm. a china pig. Hmm. And yeah, china right. is, uh, it's a word that has a kind of nasty valence hmm. to it now, but it wasn't always nasty. Uh, and it's still quite commonly used to mean China or Chinese. It, Part of the drama of this story is, well, not part of, the drama of the story is is down to this question of, okay, now I'm here. Uh, when do you stop being Chinese? Do you stop being Chinese? Because I can't speak Chinese. I can't eat Chinese food. He's not allowed to speak Chinese. Yeah, right. He he can still speak that, it. That's what I mean, though. Can't. Yeah. He's not sure, able sure. to, like, you know, no, no, no access to Chinese people. But he actually... He, he actually Physically, at some points, he's physically not sure if he can still write Chinese, like if he has that capability. So it's uh, important to distinguish. Right. And that's most of the story is him saying, you know, where, where do I, should I just kill myself? I don't know if I should. I don't know if I have the guts for that. Uh, you know, he I'll keep on living. It. He thinks about it, but he keeps on living. And, and again, it's this tension. Do I keep on living? And if so, how? As what? Like as Malaysian? I don't really want to be full on Malaysian. But I'm not able to be Chinese. But what's interesting is he actually becomes the, the so even as Malaysian civilization, and I'm using those words in air quotes, the scare quotes that, that the listener can't see, um, even as he becomes castrated, literally castrated by Malaysian society and this Malaysian Figuratively prince. castrated. They don't literally castrate him. Almost. I mean, eh. whatever. Uh Anyways, he is actually imparting, he becomes the mm. agent to impart Malaysian civilization to these islanders who, as we go through the story, we learn they actually might be sort of Chinese. Like they're Muslims, so technically they they qualify for Malaysian status, native Malaysian status. The word for that in, in Malaysia is Bumiputra. That means literally, it's the Malaysian word for sons of the soil, and it's used to mean not ethnically Chinese and not Indian. Those are the two non-Malaysian, again, I'm using the scare quotes, right. uh, non-Malaysian groups who, who play a significant role in Malaysian society. And, and what's fascinating is even as he is becoming symbolically circumcised by Malaysian civilization, he is also like inculcating Malaysian civilization into these people because he actually is a teacher of Malaysian. And his, his government minder on the island is like, oh, you Chinese people. You're so good at like civilizing and opening up islands. So you're going to teach these people how, because previously these people had just kind of like wandered around the sea. They're technically Malay, but they're not really a part of Malay society, mainstream society. And he is, and he, his job was to teach them agriculture, to teach them the Malaysian language, literally to teach them the ABCs. That That's the, the, in the Chinese text, he actually uses the word ABCs. Um, to, that's one of the things that he does is he civilizes them. So even as he's, as the narrator Liu is being civilized and being circumcised by Malaysian society and his Chineseness is being kind of uh, cut, all, cut away from him. And yet, one of the fun things about this story is he never lets you go completely one way or the other so yes it's being cut away from him but his malaysian handlers keep referring to him and them as you chinese and he even mentions this at one point like so wait a minute i'm not allowed to be chinese but you can keep calling me chinese like what does that mean are you do you want me to move on because if you do then stop calling me that you know it's implied that the prince becomes one of the kings of malaysia 
And even as Liu, who now has a, a Malaysian Muslim name, um, even as he is becoming increasingly Islamicized, he is uh, trying to figure out a way to contact his family and sort of restore this bridge to Chineseness. Um, and one of the things he tries to do is he tries to say, hey, I'd like to go on the Hajj to Mecca. And the prince says no. Hmm. Um, and there are all these kinds of efforts that he has, even through to try and restore his Chineseness, uh, that just kind of get shut down. And there is right. this competition between Islam and and China, Islam and Chineseness, or Malaysian Islamic Malaysianness and uh, Islamic Malaysian identity and Chineseness. And a third stream, and this honestly was to me the most interesting part of the story was the Chinese communist aspect of it because he's a revolutionary and the implication is he's a communist revolutionary, right? Yeah. He, um, and, and the 1950s Chinese rebels were all it. communists. Yeah, you weren't a rebel for democracy or anything. Now, what's interesting about this is that he rebels in favor of this supposedly international communist or Maoist, if you like, um, ideology, which is based on this trifecta of the soldier, peasant, worker, right? That these these are the real folk. These are the the new proletariat, right? So he rebels in favor of this, but ironically, it's his punishment that actually leads to him fulfilling this promise, right? Because he's sent to the ultimate of the nobodies. Like, can you think of any more peasant than this? Like people scraping rocks out of the ground. He shows up, and you know, if you want to read it this way through his good communist upbringing, teaches them how to have a proper well-yielding farm so they can support themselves and not require the dirty capitalists for all their wares. And he says at some point that he sort of finds this transcendental meaning yeah. in his his peasant labor. Which reads like the best case scenario for the down to the countryside movement that Mao brings into 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 to play to to sort of quote unquote give the the red guards a new opportunity but mostly get them the hell out of the capital you know that kind of thing yeah. um capital the cities during the cultural revolution uh this is the best case scenario right you send them out to the people and they have this mutual beneficial effect but the other thing that's interesting about this is that if you're a true communist you're not a nationalist you're not a hardcore dedicated Chinese or Russian or German or whatever. That's the I the ideal, right? right. But and it's in his fulfilling this program that he goes, man, I'm just Chinese. Like, I can't just yeah. not be that way. And he says at one point that he feels uh, like the ghosts that haunt him are not the ghost of Mao or the ghost of Marx. It's the, the ghost of his friends who right. are like, why did you betray his revolutionary Chinese-ness. friends who lost their lives while he didn't lose his yeah. right apparently we still don't yeah, actually don't. know that but it's i think it's implied i mean implied. i th- it sounds like yeah the way they save him is sure. you know th- three of the gunners actually shoot the other guys and one of them shoots above him sure. or something i don't know because it's a firing squad uh anyway the story is beautifully written and one of the reasons it's so so interesting is that he, you're never really allowed to land anywhere there's never a point where he's like, and you know what? I'm done with Malaysia. I'm breaking out of here, and if they want to shoot me, that's cool. Let's roll, you know? He does almost at some points when he's he's kind of getting old. In the 1970s, he does almost have contact with Chinese people because you have these Chinese people who are fleeing from Vietnam. Hmm. And uh, he sees them. I don't know how he knows they're Chinese, but he does know that they're Chinese. They're uh, kind of fleeing from Vietnam, and one of the places they end up is the ocean around his island. Mm. Um, and so he does, like, almost have these fleeting moments where he can reconnect with his Chineseness, but he, it just never, never gets there. Never happens. And again, he asks this question at one point: What does it mean to be Chinese? Is it the language? Is because if it's if it's the language, if it's access to the culture, access to one's ancestors, the food, then I'm not Chinese anymore. And he says he says at the very beginning, his mother told him that you know, like there are, 
Chinese people and there are foreigners. And you got you're, you're one of the you're other. one of the other. And the thing that the only way you can be like if you're Chinese and you can become a foreigner or vice versa, the only way you can do that is by being raised from a very young age uh, by the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and then she ends up by saying, you are what you eat. Yeah. Um, and he's not eating he's, this stuff he's anymore. He's not able he's, to eat pork he can't anymore. Eat pork. He's eating whatever the islanders are eating, lots yeah. of curry and coconut leaves and things like that. Oh, man, you're um, making me hungry. I know, right? I'm, it's getting close to dinner time. That does mm. sound really... It, it's one of those stories where occasionally they'll be cooking something and you go, oh, man, I wish I could eat that right now. I, I did not feel the need to drink coconut wine while being uh, Cast, uh, circumcised. circumcised. No, that was not a point where I had any desire <laughs> to participate in the culture. I was a little but, surprised. I don't I don't know the rules about coconut wine in, in I don't Malaysian Muslim society. Of course, I don't know next to anything about... Uh, Islam in Malaysia. A little more about Islam. Definitely not... The Malaysian version, or what you know, Malaysian Islam, culture. Yeah. Um, but now, see, this is also an interesting thing, and I'll start wrapping it up with this comment. Um, y- you can't. I swear, people who who have never really encountered much Chinese literature or Chinese culture are truly not aware of how vast this is. You know, one of the controversies that leads to the study of Sinophone versus Chinese literature is the number of groups of Chinese speaking people who have never even been to China, right? They're in Singapore, Malaysia, all over the world, right? And they're going, well, it's, you know, if it's Chinese literature, does that mean it has to be related to the country of China? Because we're not that, you know? Mm. Um, It's a vast network, and it's vastly complicated, and and it vastly complicates this idea of national identity. Mm. So what exactly am I? Where, Where do you draw this line? You know, on this side, you're Chinese, on this side, you're not. I would also, so I definitely 100% agree with you. Um, One of the reasons that Chinese literature has been so focused on the giant country of China is just because it's so huge. Yeah. But you have these outcroppings of Chinese literature in other places. You have these communities that have been, I mean— Chinese people have been in Malaysia for six, seven, eight hundred years, uh, and they've been writing in Chinese for that long, pretty much. Um, interestingly, In Kim Chu himself personally left Malaysia, as so many Chinese ethnic Chinese people have have done. Um, ethnic Chinese people tend to to be very important in terms of Malaysia's economy, and that's one of the complaints of the Bumiputra the sons of the soil in Malaysia, is that they complain that they just dominate the economy too much. And so they actually have a system of quotas to to essentially go against Chinese and Indian folks in the country of Malaysia, even for native people born in Malaysia. And so uh, In Kim Chu, because of some of these quotas. He went to college in Taiwan. He's now a professor in Taiwan. He's essentially become Taiwanese in a lot of ways. I mean, it's hard. The reverse of the story almost. Yeah. And and I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why he's struggling with this question of identity. It's dominated his work. Uh, and I think it also plays into this question that we in the U.S. are struggling with. And one of the things I think is so interesting about this story is that it it pushes back against the sort of post-colonial critique. You know, in the U.S. right now, we have this tension over Columbus Day versus Indigenous Day and, you know, whether or not non-Indigenous folks belong in in this territory. And this is true in Australia and, and a lot of places that you go. But what's so interesting about this story is it makes a moral case— that that at least in this situation, post-colonial theory is totally off. It totally doesn't get it. Like the Chinese folks are the disenfranchised ones. They're the ones who are literally circumcised, metaphorically castrated, and don't have that power that post-colonial critiques assume that the non-indigenous people have. I think, though, for a for a fuller critique of that, you'd have to look because what well, you know one of the part of that one of the avenues of this critique, the post-colonial critique, is not that it's a straight up 
the colonizers have power, the colonized don't. It's the degree in the ways in which the colonized regain power oftentimes is precisely in the same manner that it was practiced on them in the first place. They learned this from the oppressors, quote unquote, it's a horrible word, but whatever. Um, so I get your point. Um, in in the, case, the case of the Chinese, it's an interesting one because, you know, we started this series off reading a, a Vietnamese poet, colonial Vietnamese poet. Um, and, you know, if you are able to write beautifully written poetry in a truly deeply Chinese style and you speak Chinese and you belong in a Chinese colonized area, doesn't that kind of make you Chinese, you know? Yeah, I mean, so that poet was, she's ethnically Vietnamese, right. but, but there is this question of, is China the colonial power in that situation? And here, I think you're right. This is This dynamic is reversed, right? Like China, Chinese folks came there to colonize, but they didn't really have any power, and and now they're being essentially ethnically cleansed from the region. Right, to a and but see, this is the the really interesting part of the story, though, to me is that it isn't that that it isn't that he is Chinese and he's being marginalized. the The point of the story is not I am Chinese, but I have to live on this stupid island. The point of the story is now that I'm out here, I'm beginning to wonder. Where exactly am I Chinese? You know, I dis uh, I disagree. He he maintains this idea. He says he has a zhi na zhi ho, ho uh, burning through him, uh, uh, a Chinese fire burning right, through him, th his spirit this, the whole time. Sorry, I interrupt. Totally interrupt you. Go ahead and finish the thought. Yeah, he does have that, but what is it? It's he, just this metaphysical spirit. But all the other things that a Chinese person could point to that make them who they are, he doesn't have. So if there's this last burning ember that you cannot possibly put words to, what does that mean? Does that mean you, you the part of you that is Chinese is a part that nobody can possibly recognize, identify, explain, or anything else? In which case, does it exist at all? You know, I mean... I think you're, the points you bring up are valid, but I think that he, the narrator, maintains his his access to this identity of Chineseness throughout the whole thing. And what I would point though to, and this is this is such an important aspect of any sort of debate about immigration, is that as soon as you start identifying key cultural traits, well, we are this, there are always exceptions, always exceptions for the people who are in that group. They're like, oh, well, yeah, I, I actually don't think that at all, right? It's one of these things like the argument made about porn. I can't define it, but I know it when I see it that sort of thing. It's this way too. Like, look, I, I can't tell you what it means to be Chinese. I just, I just am. I just know that that's what I am. I want to speak Chinese. I don't really even know why, but I just totally do, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's this aspect of it, right? I can't tell you what it means to be Chinese, but I just totally am. I, I can't not be m Chinese. I, and I have to do this, even though I have none of these things left in me, you know? I, I think we may be at a impasse that we can't solve this question other by other other than by just stopping <laughs> stopping <laughs> hitting the brakes um That's we so but it's often a fascinating do. story we could talk about it for a lot longer it's such a great story it relates to kind of issues of identity and post-colonialism uh you should definitely read it carlos roja's book slow boat to china this story is allah's will um, highly recommend the English translation. Definitely. Of course, it's if you can read it in Beautifully written Chinese. translation. I should say that as well. Um, it's, it's it's something like this is unbelievably complex. How do yeah. you translate? Because he's working in different languages. He includes actual Malays. Chinese characters and quotes, Malaysian things. So yeah. you really have to know your stuff. And so the translation there's a bit fantastic. of English in this too. Yeah, there is. It's it's fantastically translated. And as we start to wrap things up here, let me encourage you to, to drop us a line. We're at Twitter at Chinese Lit Pod, uh, Chinese Literature Podcast at gmail.com. And of course, the website is just Chinese Literature Podcast.com. We would love to hear from you. Think about leaving us a review on iTunes. That's one of the ways we, we get the word out. And we have a lot of things in the works that will be coming up over the next few months. But for now, keep checking in on us. And people who have checked in on us, have occasionally made it onto the podcast. So there's some incentive for you. I think we'll end it there. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.